morning. Would you please tell us your name? Natalie Robertson. Hi, Natalie. Um, do you live at an address in Tempe, Arizona? Yes. And what is that address? 4605 South Priest. And who do you live with at that address? Uh, my boyfriend and my three kids. Okay. And what's your boyfriend's name? Gabriel Salas. And what are your kids' names? Janet, Stephanie, and John. How old are your kids? Uh, 15, 14, and 11. Now, that address that I asked you about where you live, um, is, is there a number that goes with it? Uh, yes, 152. And is that located at all next to any other trailers? Uh, yes, there's one trailer on each side. And at some point in time, did you come to know some people by the name of Elizabeth Johnson and Logan McQuarrie? Yes. And how is it that you got to know those people? Uh, they moved in next door. Okay. Into a trailer next door? Yes. Okay. Um, and do you recognize um, either of them in the courtroom today? Um, Elizabeth's sitting over there. And I believe... Before you, before you move on, can you please just tell us a little bit about what she's wearing and where she's sitting? Um, like a light tan shirt or and she's got a ponytail on, uh, brown hair. She used to be blonde. Are you sure about the color of that shirt? Um, actually, I'm a little bit colorblind because of my sight. So I'm guessing it's like white or tan or something khaki, maybe. <laughs> Your Honor, may the record reflect the witnesses identify the defendant? It shall so reflect. And Natalie, do you see Logan at all in the courtroom? Um, he's like right behind you, I believe. And Natalie, since we've talked already a little bit about your eyesight, can you tell us um, what your issues are with your eyesight? Um, I have toxoplasmosis. Uh, it's a parasite that uh, takes and uh, causes scarring in my eyes. And does that affect your eyesight then? Um, yes, little by little it's been going. And what exactly can you see at this point? Like how far, what can you see? What, how does um, it Pretty much power? I can see everybody in here. I mean, a little... A little bit, like, you know, not as sharp as I used to be able to. And right out of the middle of my left eye, I can see perfectly, just about. And does it also affect your ability to recognize colors? Um, lately, yes. The past year or so, I've had a harder time, you know, deciphering different colors. Now, back in September to December of 2009, was your eyesight better? Yes. And how much better was it back then? Um, I could actually read my text messages without using a pair of reading glasses. <laughs> and how about distances further away? Um, further away, even be it was better than it was now, yes. And now you have some trouble reading text messages that are in front of you? Yes. So I want to take you back to about September of 2009. Do you recall... Well, let me ask you, the address that we talked about in Tempe, Arizona, how long had you and Gabriel and your kids lived there? Um, we've been living there now for almost eight years, I think. Did you move in maybe around 2004, 2005? Yes, yeah. right around there. And at some point in time, do you recall Elizabeth Johnson and Logan McQuarrie moving in? Yes. And approximately when do you recall them moving in? Um, September, I think around September of 2009. And at the time that Logan and Elizabeth moved in, did they have a child? Uh, yes. And did you ever meet the child? Um, I saw him. I never got to hold him, but I met him. And do you know his name? Uh, Gabriel. And can you tell us what you recall about when Logan and Elizabeth moved into the home? Um, the first time I met them, uh, Logan was trying to get the air conditioner or something to work, and I was standing outside talking to uh, Elizabeth. And was Gabriel Salas with you at all during this time period? Um, he came out and introduced himself. And after this date when you met Logan and Elizabeth, did you have any contact with Elizabeth after that? Not much. And when you say not much, what type of contact did you have with her? Uh, pretty much saying hi to her. Somebody called for her on the phone, and I would take the phone over to her, but on my cell phone. And we'll talk about that time where you, someone called for her on the phone a little bit later. Okay. But I'm just asking generally, what was your contact with Elizabeth? Just saying hi, and we'd pass each other, and we'd see each other, pretty much. 
You never hung out at her house for coffee or she hung out at your house for uh, coffee? No, at that time I was gone a lot. My grandmother was sick, so. Okay. So during that time period, you were gone a lot. Where were you? Um, usually at Chandler Regional Hospital, sitting with my grandmother. She didn't want to be alone. And then, then she was moved into a home for a little while where I'd go over there and sit with her. And other than that, yeah, I was gone a lot. And would you, were you gone in the daytime or nighttime or both? Usually daytime and then sometimes in the evenings a lot. You know, I mean, she didn't like to be alone very much, so. And how's your grandma now? She's doing well. Um, so did you ever see Logan McQuarrie at the home when he was living next door to you? Yes. And did you associate with Logan? I mean, did you hang out with him at his home or have no. him come over to your home? No, I never did. What did you see when you saw Logan at his home? Uh, he did a lot of yard work, you know, work on the house and everything. Um, I would see him taking walks with Elizabeth and the baby, stuff like that. And did you ever see Logan with Gabriel Johnson? Yes. What types of things did you see Logan doing with Gabriel? Uh, taking their walks. Um, when he'd be working on the house, sometimes he'd have the baby in the stroller. Uh, you know, I'd see him cuddle him, kiss him, you know, things that a parent's supposed to do. <laughs> And you said you saw Gabriel, Elizabeth, Gabriel Johnson, Elizabeth, and Logan taking walks together? A lot of times, yes. It was like the perfect time of year for it, so. At some point in time, did you see Logan move out of the home? I noticed I hadn't seen his, his uh, vehicle that he was driving, and... Yeah, I didn't actually see him move out, but I noticed that the car, the truck or whatever wasn't there anymore. And tell us what you recall about the truck that you attribute to being Logan's truck. Oh, gosh, I don't remember really much what it looks like. It was so long ago. <laughs> Had you ever seen him around the truck or drive the truck or get yeah, out of it? Yeah, driving it. So you recognize it as being his? Yeah. And was there a point in time where you stopped seeing the truck there at the home? Yes. Uh... I would say around the, maybe like five or six days into December or something, I don't know. Uh, now, did you ever see Elizabeth Johnson move out of the home? Um, no, I never saw her move out, but all I noticed was that there was a guy that was alone there after a while, just a roommate or something. So you indicated you saw a guy over there. Mm -hmm. Do you, did you ever know that guy's name? No, I never talked to him. And did you see him move in? I didn't see him move in. Did you? Uh, what did you notice about the first time you saw him over there in the home? Well, I noticed that car was there the path for a few days before I even saw him, and I would see him, you know, leave and come back constantly. So I knew he had to have been living there. And can you describe to us what he looked like? Uh. Maybe 5'8", five 5'10", five uh, brown hair, dark brown hair. And how about thin. his build? I'm sorry. Thin. Um, did you ever talk to him? No, just to say hi to him once. Did you ever see that gentleman move out of the home? Yeah, I saw him moving out. And about in regard to time frame, from the time you first saw, saw him, noticed that he was at the home, about how much later was it that you saw him move out of the home? Maybe three or four weeks at the most. Now, you had mentioned a little earlier uh, a time when Elizabeth got a phone call and you took her your phone. Can you tell us how that whole thing started? Um, I'm not quite sure exactly how it all started. I got home. My boyfriend had told me that Elizabeth had been upset and used our phone. And then I was sitting there watching TV with the kids, and I got a phone call from a lady uh, asking for Elizabeth. So I took the phone over to her. And uh, let me ask you, what type of phone are we talking about? It was just a cell phone, a flip phone. And whose name was the cell phone in? Um, I believe my stepdad's. And is that a phone both you and Gabriel Salas used? Yeah. And when you took the phone over to Elizabeth, uh, did you listen to the conversation that they had? 
Um, no, in fact, she didn't really want to open the door at first to whoever was at, outside until she found out it was just me. <laughs> and so she opened the door and took the cell phone and then she brought it back over. And did she have any conversation with you about who it was or what the conversation no. was on the phone? No, she was always pretty standoffish. At some point in time, did you have contact with the Tempe Police Department? Um, yes. What caused you to have contact with the Tempe Police Department? Um, after this all happened, I figured that I wasn't sure who had called her on the phone, but I decided I would call the Tempe Police Department and that let them look at my phone records. And did they in fact do that? I believe so. In regard to what was happening over at the residence where Elizabeth and Logan had lived, did you see anything else going on over there in regard to Gabriel Johnson? Uh, no, not really. Did you ever see police over there searching the area? Yes. And what specifically did you see in regard to this, the police? Um, they, I know they searched the trash cans all up and down our street, and they asked us where Gabriel was. I think it was two different occasions that they asked about where Gabriel was, if we knew anything. And did you provide the police with as much information as you could about the last time you saw Gabriel Johnson? Yeah, as much information as I could, which was really nothing. I didn't know anything that was going on. I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Cross Thank you. No questions, Judge. Thank you. Does the jury have any questions for Ms. Robertson before we let her go? Doesn't look like it. May this witness be excused, Ms. Andrews? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Victor? Yes, Judge. Thank you, you may step down. Thank you. Watch your step going down. Okay. Ms. Andrews, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning. Would you please tell us your name? Gabriel Salas, S A L S. And we've just heard from Natalie, so we know a little bit about your relationship with Natalie and where you were living. So I'm going to go ahead and take your attention back to around September to December of 2009. Okay. Do you recall having neighbors by the name of Elizabeth Johnson and Logan McQuery? I do. And where did those neighbors live in relation to where you lived? Uh, they lived on the east side of our trailer, if you will, or right next door. And was that at 4605 South Priest Drive? That's correct. And do you recall the first time you ever met Elizabeth Johnson and Logan McQuery? I do. Tell us about that time. Uh, me and Natalie were out uh, taking care of our yard, and just enjoying a nice day. It was the middle of the day. Um, I was getting ready to go to work, and she had uh, shown, uh, or her and Natalie were speaking at the side of our yard where we have our dogs and she had noticed the dogs and so they started conversation and we greeted them. Can you tell us a little bit about the dogs that Elizabeth and Logan had at the time? I don't have any, uh, we had dogs, we have okay. two dogs. You had dogs, yeah. okay. Do you recall if And she had right noticed home? that, you know, she had made comment that she had like one of our dogs. Okay. Now, do you see either, do you see Elizabeth Johnson in the courtroom at all today? Yes, I do. Would you please indicate just by pointing to us and telling us a little bit about where she's sitting and what you see she's wearing? She's over here to my right, and she's wearing a blue shirt. Your Honor, may the re record reflect the witness identify the defendant? It shall so reflect. Do you see Logan at all in the courtroom today? Uh, yes, I do. He's behind you. Blue shirt. And so you indicated you met them on that day essentially around the time that they moved in? Uh -huh. Did you ever have any regular conversation with Elizabeth Johnson after she moved into the home? No, I did not. And Logan McQuarrie, did you ever have any regular conversation with Logan after he moved into the home? Just general uh, greeting of neighborly uh, conversation, like, how are you doing? And did you ever see the baby that they had with them? I have. And is that? I, I have. Is that Gabriel Johnson? Yes. Did you ever see um, specifically Logan with Gabriel Johnson? I had. And what specific things did you see Logan and Gabriel doing together? Well, he was tending to the child while he was also um, making improvements on the exterior of the house, if you will. 
And what type of improvements was he making on the home? Uh, he was putting up a fence around the perimeter of the, the, the yard itself to enclose it some more and uh, some gardening. And when you saw, when you said he was making improvements, you said Gabriel Johnson was there as well? Uh, some of the time he was. And where would Gabriel be during this time? Uh, within a short distance from the child, within a few feet. And was Gabriel like in a stroller or a carrier? He was or a in crib? a stroller or not. And during the time period that Elizabeth Johnson and Logan McQuarrie lived in the home, was there ever a time that Elizabeth asked to borrow your phone? Uh, only okay. once. Would you tell us about that incident when that occurred? Uh, I, I was taking care of the interior of the house that day. Uh, it was around the mid-afternoon, um, cleaning up my kitchen area. I was recently unemployed. Um, I had received a knock on the door, and she had requested that if she could use our phone, that there was something wrong with her phone or not charged. And I said, sure, you know, I'd oblige you, and that uh, it's urgent. I know that if you don't have a phone and you have a child, that you feel like you're disconnected from the world, and that it's the urgency of a case of an emergency. And uh, she had mentioned that uh, Logan was with the baby and that she was looking for him. And now, at some point, then you did you lend her your phone? I did. And was this a cell phone? Yes, it was a cell phone. When after you lent Elizabeth your phone, did you listen to the conversations that she had on the telephone? No, I was allowing her privacy. I, I uh, gave her the phone from the doorway and told her to use it as long as she needed to, and that when she was done with it, just please return it. And that. And, uh, go I'm ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry. But go ahead. That was pretty much it there. And at some point in time, um, did Elizabeth return the phone to you? She did some time later. I had uh, let time go by and didn't realize how much time had expired since then, then she, when she gave me the phone if you will, a few hours later. Um, do you recall as you're sitting here today what date it was that Elizabeth borrowed the phone? It was the 8th. Of what month? Of December. Okay, 2009? Correct. And... Did you later on discuss Elizabeth using the phone with the police? I did. How was it the police became aware of Elizabeth using the phone? Um, well, I'm not quite certain of it. Again, how we became of knowledge of the situation that occurred. Um, there was reporters that were uh, asking me for questions, and the police uh, arrived also with Logan and had uh, explained to us what had happened and that's when I had divulged that you know the phone had been used and we went through the series of phone numbers that correlated to what our phone numbers that we would call and any other numbers which could be excluded as not being our calls. So you sat down with the police and went specifically over the phone calls to say these are phone calls that would have been to you or Natalie and these are other phone calls you didn't recognize? Correct. And do you recall, as you're sitting here today, how long of a period of time it was that Elizabeth had your phone? Uh, roughly a few hours, two, three hours. And if the police indicated it was somewhere between 12.01 hours and 3.34 hours, does that sound about right? Yes. At some point in time, did you ever see Logan McQuarrie move from the home? No. Did you ever notice that Logan didn't appear to be at the home anymore? Uh, yeah. And about what time period was it that you noticed that Logan wasn't at the home anymore? Uh, around that same time period, uh, late November, early December, that uh, I usually had seen his work vehicle there and didn't see it any further at that and did, point. Did you ever see any other vehicle there instead of the work vehicle? No. Did you ever see anybody else living there after you stopped uh, seeing Logan's vehicle? After I saw it, after I stopped seeing his vehicle, no. <coughs> I have no further questions, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cross the nomination. No questions, Judge. Does the jury have any questions for Mr. Salas before we let him step down? Doesn't look like it. May this witness be excused, Ms. Andrews?
Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Victor? Yes, Judge. You may step down. Thank you. Watch your step going down, and the state may call its next witness. Your Honor, the state calls Detective Frank Aguilera. Okay, let's go ahead and get Detective Aguilera. Thank you. Would you please introduce yourself to the jury? Um, officer Frank Aguilera, Tempe Police Officer. And how long have you been an officer for the Tempe Police Department? A little over 23 years. Where did, what's your current assignment for the Tempe Police Department? Uh, patrol Division, as a patrol officer. And how long have you currently been in the Patrol Division? June 11th. Since June 11th? Of this year, yeah. Okay. And just prior to working at Patrol, um, since June 11th, where were you working? Uh, sex Crimes and Child child crimes. And were you a detective in that unit? Yes. And how long did you work in that unit? Ooh, I think it was about two years in that unit. And what other units have you worked in while you've been with the Tempe Police Department? Um, the gang unit, criminal investigations. Um, prior to my sex crimes and child crimes, I was in what we call the robbery night squad. And have you ever worked as a hostage negotiator? Yes, uh, since 1996. And is this, that something you currently do at this point? Yes, I do. Did you receive any type of specialized training in order to be a negotiator? Yes. And, you know, I said hostage negotiator. Are you just a hostage negotiator or just a negotiator in general? A negotiator. We, we deal with both hostage and crisis suicidal type situations as well as crises. And what type of training did you receive for that? I received uh, 40 hours of a basic negotiator school um, as well as the 40 hour advanced and have maintained um, going to seminars and uh, negotiator trainings. Uh, we hold monthly negotiator trainings as well as a unit with the uh, police department. And I'm going to ask you, not for an exact number, but just approximately in your experience as a negotiator, how many times have you had the opportunity to use those particular skills? As on a call-out situation as a negotiator, probably, uh, I would say in my number of years, uh, approximately 50 times. But it's, a, it's a, a skill that you use on a daily basis. You use that skill when you talk to people generally? Yes. When you investigate suspects of a case? Suspects, victims, um, you know, anybody that is in crisis, uh, you, you want to be able to talk to them and manage the situation. I want to take your attention back to December 10th of 2009. Would you please tell us what unit you were working in uh, during that time frame? I was working the uh, robbery night squad. And what were your particular hours at that time? 4 p.m. to 2 a.m. And who was your supervisor at that time? Uh, Sergeant Wiley. And while you were working on that day, December 10th, 2009, did you get called to assist in an investigation regarding a missing child sometime about 30 minutes after midnight? Yes. And what specifically were you... What information did you have at the time that you were asked to assist in that call? I was advised by Sergeant Wiley that uh, patrol had been out on a situation for uh, approximately a little over five hours uh, where there was a child that they were trying to locate um, and asked if I could assist. And I was directed to respond over to the trailer court on South Priest there to speak with Sergeant Kepler and Sergeant Carlton. And at some point in time, did you arrive at the trailer at that address and speak with those sergeants? Yes, it was after the 0, zero 30 hours. And when you were originally called out or when you arrived, what, what was your understanding of what your duties were supposed to be? I was asked if I could take my unmarked vehicle as well as my unmarked self and go sit in front of a trailer. Um, it was identified as number 153 in the trailer court and watch the residents to see if the young lady uh, later identified to me as Elizabeth Johnson would leave the trailer and uh, 
leave the trailer court. If she was, I was supposed to follow her. And when you arrived at the address um, did, and you spoke to Sergeant Carlton, did you and Sergeant Carlton come up with a different plan? Yes, being negotiators, both Sergeant Carlton and I, and having worked together, um, I think we, we kind of felt together that why not go chat with Miss Johnson and see if we could accomplish what patrol hadn't been able to accomplish um, in the five plus hours. And then did you in fact go in and talk to Elizabeth Johnson? Yes, we knocked on the door. She came to the door and she invited us in, uh, yes. And who did most of the talking with Elizabeth? Um, Sergeant Carlton did. And were you there for the entire conversation he had with Elizabeth Johnson? Not the entire, because when I developed information or was given information, I stepped out. Were you there for a portion of the conversation that Sergeant Carlton had with Elizabeth Johnson? Yes. Now, it's been my experience that supervisors don't tend to write reports. Is that true in this case? In that was true. So did Sar Sergeant Carlton write a report? No. Did you write a report documenting the information that you had and Sergeant Carlton provided to you? Yes. And in, do you regularly write reports as part of your job as a Tempe police officer? Yes. And is the purpose of writing the reports to document information so that later on you can, it can refresh your recollection about what occurred? Yes. And so when you wrote the report about this incident, did you attempt to document not only what you observed, but what Sergeant Carlton provided to you? Yes. Now, I asked you about meeting with Elizabeth Johnson. Do you see her in the courtroom today? Yes, I do. Would you please indicate where she's sitting and what she's wearing? She is sitting to my right at the defense table, and she's got on a some type of blue collared top, light yeah. blue. Your Honor, may the record reflect the witnesses identified the defendant? It shall so reflect. So when you and Sergeant Carlton first went in to talk to Elizabeth, where was everybody situated in the home? Um, she, Sergeant Carlton and her took a seat at the dining room table, and I believe that I, I stayed standing. Um, I want to say Sergeant Carlton um, was on this side of the table and Elizabeth was here and I was standing somewhat behind her um, by a, it uh, wasn't a nightstand, just some type of cabinet right there. And were there any officers present inside the home other than those that you've mentioned? Just Sergeant Carlton and myself. Okay. And were there any officers present outside the home at this particular time? No, they had all been... Uh, released from the scene. And while you were there, did you search the home at that time for Gabriel? You know, I don't believe I did because, uh, as I recall, the officers had already done that. How did the conversation between Sergeant Carlton and Elizabeth Johnson at that point begin? He basically introduced us to her. Um, it was a situation where he was trying to build a rapport with her and trying to get her to understand that we were there to um, ensure that the child um, was safe where this child was. Um, Sergeant Carlton advised her that we were trying to ensure the baby's safety and location. And after he advised Elizabeth Johnson of that, did she provide Sergeant Carlton with some information? She, she told us that the baby was safe. Um, Sergeant Carlton asked, you know, well, we need to verify that. And she basically told Sergeant Carlton the baby was adopted. And when she, when she first said the baby was adopted, did she tell you or Sergeant Carlton who had adopted the baby? Yes, but she first recanted the adoption and said, well, he's not adopted yet. And then she um, informed us that the baby was in North Scottsdale. And then she informed us that the baby was with a Tammy Smith and her husband. And did she name Tammy Smith's husband at that time? 
I don't believe that she really knew his name per se. Was Elizabeth Johnson able to somehow provide you with contact information for Tammy Smith at that point? Yeah, she didn't know the number offhand, but she told us the number was on her phone on the caller ID and uh, essentially handed the phone with the number listed. And what type of phone was this? I believe it was a house phone, um, cordless. And then did you obtain that phone number that was on the phone? Yes, I did. Was there one phone number or more than one phone number? As I recall, there was one phone number, and then it took me, because that number went to a business, it took me some time to locate other numbers, but having the basic information of her name and the business name and contacts with the business, I was able to eventually leave a message, and Miss Smith called me back. And during the conversation with Elizabeth Johnson, did she provide information about how she had met Tammy Smith? Yes, she did. And what did she say about how she had met Tammy Smith? She advised us that she had gone to, uh, on a trip back, uh, I believe it was Boston, to visit, and uh, on the return um, trip, she had uh, had a layover, and uh, she had ran into her, met this lady by the name of Tammy Smith. And uh, that, that's how they... Uh, and did, she, did Elizabeth Johnson indicate at this particular time any conversation that she had had with Tammy Smith either then or after then about adopting the baby? Yeah, they talked about adoption at the time at the airport. And she had actually been given the number to Tammy Smith to make that phone call, but uh, had never called her uh, till recently. And did Elizabeth indicate how long it is that Tammy Smith had had Gabriel at this point in time? No, but it was, um, there was a piece of, well, she, she indicated to us that she had given Tammy Smith guardianship or custody and had signed some paperwork. She really didn't understand or know what that paperwork was. She, she kept saying guardianship or custody. Um, and uh, she told us that she had signed that paper the day before I was there, which would have been on the 9th. Now, at some point, now that you had some contact information, did you actually talk to Tammy Smith? Yes, it was approximately 1.30 in the morning. And how was it you were able to reach her? She actually, after I left a couple messages, she returned my call, and then I returned her call and, and spoke to her. In the phone conversation with Tammy Smith, did you confirm with her that, that Gabriel was in her possession? Yes, I, I identified myself, and she advised that she did eventually. She told me she had the baby. And then at some point during this time period, did you go to the, the Smith home to verify that Gabriel was there? Yes. Before you left Elizabeth Johnson's home to go to the Smith home, was there any other conversation that you heard that Elizabeth Johnson said about the situation before you left? She, she talked about the, the idea that the reason that she, she had tried to keep the baby, she wanted to keep the baby, but she wasn't able to... Uh, provide for him herself, and she had no help financially, uh, had no family here. Um, she said she had no family here? Yes. And at some point then you went to the Smith home? Yes. Where was that located? I don't have the actual address, but it was uh, up in the far northeast area of the uh, Scottsdale mountain area uh, desert. A very dark, desolate area. And does the address 16506 East Desert Vista Trail sound correct? That sounds correct. I just don't have the verification of it. When you arrived at the Smith residence, were you able to see Gabriel? Yes. Before you went to the Smith residence, did Elizabeth provide you with a photograph of Gabriel so you knew what he looked like? I asked for it, yes. Okay. And did you have that with you? When, when you I went? went? When you went to the Smith residence? Yes. And so you saw Gabriel there at the Smith residence? Yes. And where was he when you saw him? He was upstairs uh, in the master bedroom in a um, bassinet. Is that the... I'm sorry. 
I, I think it's a bassinet um, asleep, and the room was dark, and I used the ambient light from my flashlight with the photograph to observe him. Did he appear safe and okay to you at that time? Yes. And while you were present with the Smiths, um, you had talked earlier about Elizabeth Johnson mentioning paperwork. Did you obtain any paperwork from the Smiths in regard to what Elizabeth was telling you? Yes. Your Honor, may I approach? You may. Uh, exhibit number nine is already in evidence. You may publish it. It'll take just a minute. Does this look similar to the document that Tammy Smith provided you? Yes. And the date on this is December 9th, 2009? Yes. And is this a temporary guardianship paperwork that Tammy Smith provided you? Yes. So after you verified that Gabriel Johnson was safe at the Smith's residence, did you advise the supervisors of that information? Yes, I advise my supervisor, Sergeant Wiley. I advise Sergeant Carlton as well as Sergeant Kepler, the sergeant that was the patrol sergeant at the time on scene originally. Now, other than writing your report on this incident, did you have any other any other part of investigation regarding that incident on that day? No, I was advised that the sergeants would contact the uh, uh, grandfather. Now, on a later date, on December 27, 2009, did you become involved in the investigation again? Yes. And what was your involvement on December 27, 2009? I was uh, at home watching Sunday football and got a call from a Officer Duarte. Um, he asked me if I could advise him where the Smiths lived because nobody could locate their residence. Um, they were having a difficult time. I advised him that it would be easier for me to show him, and I agreed to meet him at, I believe it was the 101 and Pima, and uh, then I would jump into their patrol unit and drive him into the area, which I did. Now, was the Smith resident dif residence difficult to find? Yes, uh, it's, yes, it's very difficult to find. But you'd been there before, so you had some idea how to get there? At 1.30 in the morning, yes. And so what time of day was it that you got the call to meet Officer Duarte? I want to say it was, I know it was after lunch, and it had to have been probably around maybe 2 or so. Not 100% sure, because I didn't write any paper on that. So you indicated you got in the patrol vehicle, and that was with Officer Duarte? And Officer Lau, because I actually sat in the back seat. And so did you all travel to the Smith's residence together? Yes. When, before you met Officer Duarte and Officer Laux, had, had you been briefed on why it is they needed to go to the Smith residence again? Officer Duarte briefed me over the phone. And did you have any further conversation or briefing once you met with them in person? The officers? Yes. I'm sure we did. At some point in time on December 27, 2009, did you arrive at the Smith residence? Yes. Okay. When you arrived, um, what did the three of you individually do while you were there? Uh, we walked up to the front door, knocked on the door, and I introduced uh, the Smiths to the two officers, advised them that they were doing an investigation and wanted to talk to them. And... We had talked before about meeting with Tammy Smith. Had you met with her husband on the prior incident where you were there? Yes, he was there. And what's his name? Mr. Smith. Okay. Do you recall his first name? I don't. Does Jack sound familiar? It, Jack is... 
And either on the 9th or the 27th, did you ever meet any children who lived in the home? Uh, there was a young girl, approximately maybe four years of age. And you met her. Was she there on December 27, 2009? You know, I don't recall that she was there. When you were there on December 27, 2009, did you or the other officers look to see if Gabriel Johnson was at the home on that day? Um, the two officers searched the property um, and the residence. And what were you doing while the other officers were searching the residence? Standing in the foyer. Were you having any conversation with Tammy or Jack Smith? I could have been, but I wasn't recording anything. Okay. Nothing that you specifically recall? No. You weren't assigned to question them about what was going on? No. Were Officer Duarte and Officer Lux ever able to find Gabriel Johnson there at the home? No. And did either of those officers talk to Tammy or Jack Smith about Gabriel's whereabouts? I'm sure they did, but I, again, didn't take any reports or anything on that. It wasn't something that you participated in? No. At some point in time, while you were there on December 27, 2009, or shortly thereafter, um, were you provided with some communications between Tammy Smith and Elizabeth Johnson? Yes, there was a, a they had provided or shown Officer Duarte some information on the computer, and uh, or Texas, and there was an issue of getting that information back to the officers, so I said they could send it to my um, droid phone, and then I could transfer it over to Officer Duarte's uh, computer, email it to him. And did you, in fact, get those messages on your droid phone while you were there at the home? Yes. And then did you, at some point in time, send them to Officer Duarte? Yes, so he could, could complete his report and impound them. Did you read through those messages yourself? I might have, but I don't recall what they said. I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Cross-examination? No questions, Judge. Okay, does the jury have any questions for Officer Aguilar before we let him go? Doesn't look like it. May this witness be excused, Ms. Andrews? Yes, Sean. Mr. Victor? Yes, sir. You may step down. Thank you. Thank you. And the state may call its next witness. The state calls Detective Bailey. Okay, so let's go ahead and get Detective Bailey. Ms. Romuno, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Detective. Would you please state your full name? Sure. My name is Todd Bailey. And who are you employed by? I am a detective with the City of Tempe Police Department. How long have you been employed by the Tempe Police Department? Uh, I was hired in August of 1997. I spent about four years in our patrol bureau. Joined the Investigations Division in 2001. And in about 2006, uh, was specialized in the Computer Forensic Unit, where I've spent my career since. Now, specializing in the Computer Forensic Unit, what does that involve? Uh, the computer forensic unit, uh, as the name implies, we, we look at computers. We look at really any any devices that can hold digital electronic data. Um, initially, that's the computers, the laptops, the hard drives. Uh, over time, it's expanded. You have thumb drives. You have cell phones now are, are huge. Uh, GPS units, digital recorders, anything that can hold electronic data. Um, and we can kind of get to it with our, with our friends at computers and start analyzing that data. Um, it really kind of falls into our office. And what type of training did you have to have to become part of that unit? Uh, since joining the Investigations Bureau, uh, I think the last count was over 700 hours of continuing education um, training as far as data recovery, del recovering deleted files, um, how to analyze different devices, um, internet, email, all sorts of anything that kind of falls into our office, we've gotten some training on it. And during that time, have you had on-the-job experience as well in conducting those types of examinations on your own? Oh, yes, yes. I'm going to draw your attention to December of 2009. Did you become, well, actually January of 2010, did you become involved in an investigation that had begun in December of 2009? Yes. All right. And specifically, on the day of January 6, 2010, were you asked to analyze uh, some devices that had come into the custody of the police department. Yes, I was contacted by detectives working on the case and asked to provide assistance. All right, and what were you asked to do on that date? Uh, there were a couple of things that, that came into our office. Uh, there was a, a GPS unit, um, there was a, a camera, 
Um, later on, there was also a recorder. Though those three things were brought in either on the sixth, seventh, so right around that time frame. Okay. Now I'm going to take those <clears throat> items one by one. Let's start with the uh, GPS device. Okay. <clears throat> was this called a Magellan GPS? device? Yeah, it was a, it's a little portable one that can go in your car and your dash or you can carry it. It's a Magellan Road Meet. Um, it, it is a, yes, a little portable GPS device. And was this provided to the Tempe Police Department by the Miami Beach Police Department or the Federal Bureau of Investigations because it was found in Florida? To my understanding, yes. Okay. And was this device found in connection with Elizabeth Johnson? It was the detectives working that case and that was my understanding, yes. All right. Now, as far as your involvement with the GPS device, what did you do specifically? Uh, it was it was first brought to us and asked, what can we find from this GPS device? Uh, we had never actually, there's another detective that I work with, and so we bounced ideas off each other. We had never actually seen one of these exact models before. Um, so the first thing we did is researched it, looked it up online, um, tried to figure out what this, this device is capable of doing. Um, and the GPS, GPS device specifically, um, during the research, I, I discovered a software program that was designed to pull data off the, the uh, GPS. So we got a copy of that software. Um, actually ended up contacting one of the software creators of that program and, and walking through the process to, to make sure we were doing it correctly. All right. And once you obtained that information, were you able to extract information from the GPS device? Yes. The, the GPS, um, we could actually hook it up to our forensic computers and, and extract the data from it. And then the software program that it discussed actually analyzes that data. So when it comes off, it, it's in, in logs and, and other computer, computer written language that, you know, you, looking at it, you can't really understand what that means. The software program is able to, to interpret that and figure out like latitude and longitude and different things and actually plot those on a map. Um, in this case specifically, the, the GPS didn't record exactly like a, what I call a breadcrumb trail. It didn't, it didn't show you where you've been. It just showed you um, like what, what I often refer to as favorites. Like if you wanted to have your house as a memorized place or somewhere else as a memorized place, it just had that was really the most information we could get off the GPS. Okay, and as far as <clears throat> the information contained in that GPS device, I, I just want to make sure we all understand, it's information that the user of that device would input into the device. Correct, the, yeah. Everything that I learned is that it didn't come pre-programmed with certain areas. Um, I use the word favorites. I'm not sure if that was the exact term in this device unit, but um, the, the areas, that, the custom points that you put in, um, you, a, a person actually had to type that in. Um, whether they got there and hit save or they typed, I want to go to this location, I couldn't tell you which one, but I could just tell you that that location was saved as a point of reference. All right. And as far as your forensic examination of this, <clears throat> you indicated that you had hooked it up to one of your forensic computers? Yes. Okay. And what is the protocol that is involved in doing that? Why do you do that? Um, the, the forensic computers we have are, you know, they're, they're purchased from day one off the shelf. We set up all the software on them. We set them up to the settings that we know exactly what our computers do when it connects to a device. Um, in forensics, our ultimate goal is not to change anything. Um, when you plug a thumb drive into a computer, the computer assigns a drive letter to it because that's what a normal user wants to do. We as forensic guys don't want that to happen. We don't want any changes to occur. So we use special hardware and, and we have these attached to our forensic computers. And we call them hardware write blockers. It's, it's basically a device that just goes between my forensic computer, the hardware write blocker, and then whatever I'm looking at. And what this hardware write blocker does is it prevents any changes from occurring. So it just reads, but it won't write. So if there was um, you know, any files on, on whatever we're looking at, in this case we're talking about GPS, if there were any files on there, any dates, times, you know, any indication whatsoever, I know that my procedures would not alter that because physically the, the wire running between my friends and computer and it, it the, the wire doesn't exist. So I can't make any changes to the stuff we're looking at. I can only read from the device if that's what you're getting And at. this essentially enables you to look at an item exactly as it is when you get it. Yes. No changes are made, No, nothing's put into that device. You're looking at it the same way the, the, the way it was left when the last person used it. Correct. I, I'm, I'm extremely 100% confident that when I start an exam and when I finish the exam, the item that I'm looking at is never changed in any way, shape, or form. That's the last thing we want to do is make a change. If we do ever get to a point where something has to be modified to continue the exam, we document that, obviously, because that change, we want to be able to reproduce what we did. 
And so we, I am confident 100% that nothing changed from the beginning of the exam to the end of the exam. And at the end of your exam, you indicated that did you was a report created regarding your findings? Yeah, the software that we ended up getting um, is called Blackthorn software, and what what it will do is those those favorites, it pulls those out and actually plots those on a map for you, so it's a little bit easier to see. It, it just saves a little bit of time. You could actually go through the latitude and longitude and, and do that yourself, but it, it came out in, the, in a nice report format. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. I'm showing you what's marked as States Exhibit 21. Do you recognize this document? Yes. And what is that? This is the Blackthorn report. The, this was created by the software we used to look at the, to analyze the data that was obtained from the GPS unit. Thank you. Your Honor, the state moves to enter into evidence Exhibit 21 at this time. Any objection? No objection. Exhibit 21 is admitted. Permission to publish? You may. Now, Detective, this is a seven page document, correct? It says seven of seven on it? Yes. Here. Okay. And I'm just going to have you explain briefly for the jury uh, what each of this, what each page of this document contains. Okay. Now, on this first page, what, what does this indicate? This first page on the on the left here, the column under files, and it says file name. Um, it's kind of hard to read. The first one, I think, it says like develop image .xml or along that line. That that column on the far left, those are the different files that are stored on the GPS unit itself. Um, so that's where the the settings are stored for the GPS unit. As you kind of scroll across to the right, the next column down says device capture, and that, that's the Magellan Roadmate 1420, so that's telling... Detective, you need to scroll down a little bit. Okay, sorry. Start with device capture. Uh, device capture column uh, that describes the device that the information was obtained from. So in this case, it says the Magellan Roadmate 1420 and a, and a date and time there. The next column over is file size. Um, that just is telling us how big that file is specifically on the GPS. Uh, the next three columns, uh, there's one called MD5, one called SHA1 or SHA1, and one called SHA256 or SHA256. Those are, are uh, mathematical things that we use in, in forensics. It, it basically takes a, in a layman's terms, a fingerprint of the file. So that way we can tell exactly what it looked like. So if you were to go back and look at it again today and determine what the MD5 is, you could compare those numbers and you would know that the files have not changed since you know, 2010 when we first looked at this. And that's what those three columns are for. And um, this device capture, the date that's indicated here of uh, January 7th, 2010, is that the date that you captured the information from the Magellan device? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> now going on to page two of the report, um, could you please explain what this page contains? Uh, this page is, is showing a, a map of the United States and there's actually plots on the on the map. And you can see some in Texas, um, some up in Tennessee, and some down in the bottom right for Florida. Um, and what this is basically doing, I think if you go down to the bottom of the page, these are the different locations that had been typed into the GPS unit. And what this map is just doing is showing you that this is where they are in the United States. There's there's some, for example, the, the Texas one, I believe, that there will be more than one pl plot there. But because the map is so far zoomed out, it just looks like one. But on the uh, next few pages, you'll see that it actually zooms in on certain areas, and you'll see more than one at a, at a city. Okay, so when you're saying that it looks like it's one plot, are you referring to these? Yes, the black dots okay. there. All right, but these are actually indicating that all of these addresses are in these areas? Correct. The, the list at the bottom that you point to, um, you know, it says location, like, 0006, and then an address, uh, that, that is information that was typed into the GPS as a, a place to remember. Okay. I can't tell you if that person specifically went to that address or if they just typed it in, but that was in the GPS unit as a place to remember. All right. Now, specifically, the first location <coughs> that's used on this is 525 East 10th Street in Houston? Correct. The next address, would you read the next address that is on this list? Sure. The Location 7, the address is 13,279 West, and it, it's kind of hard to see there. It looks like an H10, San Antonio, Texas. Right, and the third? Uh, it just has the name of Homegate as the location, and then there's a street name to the right of it. It says McDermott Freeway, 
Uh, again, W looks like the little H10, and the next line is W Interstate 10, San Antonio, Texas. All right, and the next address? Uh, location number 9, 9266, looks like Encino, E-N-C-I-N-O, uh, V-L-G, San Antonio, Texas. All right, and location 10? Location 10, the location name is Chandra, all capital letters, S-H-A-N-D-R-A. -A. The address there is 9266 Encino, VLG, San Antonio, Texas. And location 11? Uh, location 11, uh, the location name is Edmund Cody Library. The address 11441 Vance Jackson Road, San Antonio, Texas. And location 12 is for Cricket in San Antonio, Texas? Correct. All right, and 13 is another address in San Antonio, Texas as well, correct? Correct. As well as 14? Correct. And then location 15, could you read that location, please? Location 15, it looks like 685 Green Park, Nashville, Tennessee. And the next location is back in San Antonio at the Target? Correct. All right, and... Location 17 is an address on Interstate 35 in San Antonio, Texas. Correct. And then locations 18 through 20 are various addresses in Miami Beach or Fort Lauderdale area, Florida. Correct. Is that correct? Okay. And the third page, what does this indicate? This is one of those zoomed in um, locations. You can see that there's several of the little black dots on the map. Um, the map itself is a kind of a zoom in on San Antonio, Texas, and this just plots where some of the previous addresses were, so you can kind of get a reference. That first map you showed, it only had one dot for the Texas area. This is just showing you that, you know, there appears to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different dots there, so it's a little bit more reference for the user. Okay. And then there's a second map on this page. Yes. Uh, again, San Antonio, if, if you scroll, if you move the map to the right just a little bit, it says on the left there, San, yeah, keep going to the right just so there, you go north, northern San Antonio locations, that's how the, the GPS is describing those. So this one pinpoints a little, pinpoints it a little bit more with the actual address as well? Yes. And is that the same on page three for the top map? Yeah, again, if you just go to the left a little bit, it'll tell you what the, they're calling that northwestern San Antonio locations. And then the, the bottom map on page four is the South San Antonio locations? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> then we go to page five of seven, and this is a map of Houston locations? Correct. Or one location at least? Correct. And then the bottom map is South of Nashville location? Correct. Okay. And page six of seven now, it looks like... These are the South Florida locations. Correct. And Fort Lauderdale. Correct. And then the last page, 7 of 7, <clears throat> zeroes in on Miami Beach locations. Correct. Okay. Thank you. This seems like it might be a good natural breaking point since it's lunch time, so let's go ahead and take our... Uh, lunch break, ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a break until 1.30. Until then, remember the admonition. We'll see you at 1.30. Okay, so um, we left off with uh, Detective Bailey's testimony. We'll go back to that. We are in direct examination from Ms. Ramuno. So, Ms. Ramuno, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Detective, we left off talking about the uh, Black Farm GPS report. Um, you also mentioned earlier during your testimony that you examined a digital camera. Yes. Okay. And is this a Nikon Coolpix digital camera? Correct. And was this also received um, from Miami Beach or Federal Bureau of Investigations? Yes, it came Miami? in. It came in at the same time okay. as the GPS. And then it was purported to be property of Elizabeth Johnson. Yes. All right. Now, tell us how you examined the digital camera. Uh, same thing. We first research the item to see, usually over the internet, um, an owner's manual type thing to learn what the capabilities are of the device. Um, in this case, the camera 
It has a what they call a secure digital or an SD card that slides in and out of it. That's where the pictures are stored at. Um, we've received training on how to e extract the data from those cards, so we remove the card from that. The camera itself also has settings. Um, the settings, there's no way for us to actually go through forensically and extract those. So you actually just turn the camera on and kind of push buttons in the menu to see where the settings are set, making sure not to make any changes. Uh, we used our forensic computer to look at the contents of the SD card. There were, as expected, lots of photos on that card. It came from a digital camera. Um, so we looked at the settings of the camera and the photos that were on the card. When you looked at the settings of the camera, what information did you find? Uh, there's, there's different things you usually look for. A date and time. If, if the uh, camera takes a picture, usually the, the date and time from the camera itself is embedded into the picture. So it's important that we go back and look at the camera settings to figure out what the date and time were. Um, in this case, the date and time, uh, the date was accurate. The time, it looked like it was set to an eastern time zone, so there was about a three hour difference, um, which to me means that if there's a three hour difference in the time, that could be explained by that time set offset. Uh, so we looked at the camera that way. Okay, and when you examined the SD card, how many images did you find on that? How many photos did you find? Um, the, the SD card, secure digital card, it can hold lots of pictures. I, I don't remember right off the top of my head the maximum size of the card, but there were hundreds of photos um, going back in 2009, 2008, 2007. Now, did you focus in on any particular time frame at that point once you located all the images? Yes. The detective I was working with, Detective Thompson, um, he had asked that we just focus on a, a the photos that were taken more recently. Um, I believe, if memory correctly, it's, it's December 20th onward. Um, we didn't need to worry about the photos that were taken prior to that. So we just looked at the photos from December 20th until the most recent photo. All right, and did you find a particular amount of images during that time? Between the December 20th date, um, there were, since that date, I should say, there were 66 pictures, I believe, that were on the card. And did the images date from, you, you said you began on December 20th, 2009. What was the last date that you noted that pictures uh, were taken? I, I want to look at the report for the exact date, but I believe it was December 26th. I think it was about a six-day range. All right. And was this information transferred to a CD, the, fo the images themselves? Yes. And, and, and step back just a little bit. The, the forensic process we do, again, is not to change any evidence. So one of the first things we do with our forensic machine is copy everything off. And then we look at the copy, so that way there's no chance I can mess up the original. Then to those copies over here, we're talking about the 66 photos. I was able to save those 66 to a CD and provide them to the case agents. And the 66 images that you noted, were they primarily images of the child in question, Gabriel Johnson? Yes. Okay. Now. Contained outside of those 66 images, were there also images of Elizabeth Johnson, Logan McQuarrie, and Gabriel Johnson? Yes. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. I'm showing you what's marked as Exhibit 120. And does this thumb drive contain selected images from the 66 images that you located on the SD card that day? Yes, I don't remember specifically this thumb drive, but we'd seen this a little bit earlier, and I, I believe they were. Right. Are the state moves to enter into that as Exhibit 120 this time? Any objection? Yeah, you may. No objection, Judge. Exhibit 120 is admitted. You may. Detective, I know that this is kind of blurry from here. Um, 
I don't have any way of blowing it up any further. He's looking at it a little more closely than the jury is because he's got the screen in front of him, so he might be able to tell you what specific numbers are. Okay, there's um, four columns in the center of the screen there, correct? Correct. All right, and can you explain to the jurors what each of those columns, the titles of the column and what they signify? Sure. We're, we're looking at uh, basically the contents of that thumb drive that you just showed me. The first column on the far left, the, the column title is name. And then there's you know, several um, files there that are actually look like pictures. Um, the mouse is covering one up there, but the file names are consistent. They start with a D, S, C, N, and then a four-digit number. Uh, the very top one, it looks like 1069. And then as the files go downward, they all, again, begin with the D, S, C, N. And then there's different numerals indicating the pictures are... That you, when the camera takes a picture, it generally numbers it in sequential order. And these are the numbers that are here. Um, the next column over is size. And there's a, a number there indicating kilobytes or the size of the file. And those all look consistent. The next column over is called type. And that's basically a, an interpretation of the file extension. In this case, it's JPEG, which is a, a common picture format. The last column there says date picture taken. And there's some dates listed there with times. Uh, for example, the top one says 5, 2, 2009, 12.02 a.m. Uh, that information is generally taken from the file itself. So when the, when the digital camera takes a picture, it embeds that information that the camera was set to, the date and time. And that's what's being displayed here is that information that was taken from the camera when that file or that picture was created. And um, just going to click on each one. Okay. Um, the first one is the name. Yes, just for clarification, the, the picture you pulled up, up at the top in the blue bar, it's kind of hard to see there, but at the top left, it'll say DSCN1069. That's right the arrow is. Correct. That's the file name. That's and then, the file name, which corresponds with this top file name here. Correct. And the second one is DSCN1093. Correct. And what is the date this picture was taken? Uh, 5 3 2009 11:58 p.m. And the next picture could you read the number of the picture and what the data was taken? Yes, DSCN 1096 and that picture was taken on 5 4 2009 at 12:11 a.m. And the next picture DSCN 2033 and that picture was taken on 12 20, 2009 at 2.55 a.m. And the next picture? DSCN 2042. And that picture was taken on 12 21, 2009 at 4.48 a.m. And the next picture? DSCN 2045. And that picture was taken on 12 22, 2009 at 11.07 p.m. DSCN 2060, and that picture was taken on 12 23 2009 at 9 54 p.m. And this picture here? DSCN 2068, that picture was taken on 12 24 2009 at 6 15 a.m. And the next picture? DSCN 2091. And that picture was taken on 12 25 of 2009 at 8 25 a.m. And this picture here? DSCN 2100. And that picture was taken on 12 26 of 2009 at 740. It's either 740 or 748 a.m. It's hard to see that last digit there. And just so we're clear, this represents just a portion of the pictures that you found on the camera that day. Or yeah. On the SD card. Yeah, those pictures there were just a sampling of the of the pictures that were found on the SD card from the camera. In addition to examining uh, the digital camera, did you also assist in 
examining a digital recorder that was provided to you by Detective Thompson? Yes. Uh, they, uh, a few days after this, these two items were brought in, they brought in a, a little Sony micro digital recorder. It's like a little personal recorder. Okay. And was that purported to belong to Logan McQuarrie? Correct. And were you able to extract information from that as well? Yes. Uh, same process. Researched it. Um, discover that there's actually a, a Sony program that you can download and install on your computer and that interacts with the recorder. Through that program I was able to extract all the recordings on there, put those onto a CD and then give them back to the detective. All right, thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you. Cro Examination, Mr. Victor. <clears throat> Detective, just to be clear, um, I want to make sure that everybody understands that sampling of pictures that we just went through with those dates, 122609 at 740 or 748, depending on whether that's a zero or an eight, is that the, la the latest picture in time that was found on that camera? Correct. There are no pictures that are taken. Uh, on that camera later than that than that date and time. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have, Judge. Thank you. Any redirect? No, thank you, Your Honor. Okay, before we let uh, Detective Bailey step down, does the jury have any questions for him? We do have some questions. Thank you. Would counsel please approach? Detective, I've got some questions from the jury. I'm asking, but they're really asking, so give them the answer. And I want to make sure, uh, I'm going to change a word or so with one of the questions, and then I want to make sure if the jury asked the question thinks I messed up the question to let me know. Um, if you know, are the locations put in the GPS in, um, in order of the input by the user? That is, are they the same order that they were inputted by the user? I, I don't know that answer. I, I don't believe that it would be stored that way, um, but I don't know that to, for the complete honesty. Okay. Any follow-up, Ms. Ramuno, to that question? No, you're Any follow-up, Mr. Victor? No, okay, next question. Um, <clears throat> uh, can, you, um, can you clarify or can you confirm that you were not able to track the GPS where it was or verify that the GPS was at a certain location or at a site that was reflected? Yes, the, the model of the GPS um, was not as top of the line, if I want to use lack of better words, that it didn't store that information. So it just stored the places that the user actually typed in. Um, it, it would not store, uh, for an example, it, if we said I want to go to the corner to go get lunch today and I typed in the address there, and then I went there, it would not tell me how I got there. It would not say if I went down the stairs or if I went down the elevator or if I threw it out the window. It would just say the lunch place in the corner is where I wanted to go. And would it tell you whether you actually went to the lunch place? No. It would just say that that place was the one that was typed in. It, again, it wouldn't tell you any locations or time-based information. It would just tell you what the address they typed in. Any follow-up to that question, Ms. Romuno? Very briefly. Um, just so it's, we all understand, it's not a GPS device that tracks someone's movements. Correct. Correct? It's, okay. Yeah, it's a personal GPS device you buy at the store. And it, 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 again, it has some maps built into it. So as you're using it, it'll actually show you the roads or whatever you're on. But it doesn't keep track of the information of where you've been just a second ago or where you're at. It just shows you where it's, when it's turned on, it shows you where you're at or a location of where to go to. Thank you. Any follow-up, Mr. Victor? No, Judge. Okay, next question. Do you know um, the user of the GPS? Who was the person who inputted that information into the GPS? No. Just the, the GPS, when it's brought to us, just whatever data is in it, that's the only thing. There's not like a user account or anything of that nature. Any follow-up, Mr. Romano? No, thank you. Any follow-up, Mr. Victor? No, Judge. Okay, any other questions for Detective Bailey while we've got him here from the jury? I think we have one. Okay, so sit tight. Okay, another question for you. You ready? Um, is there any way to know how old the GPS is or how long it had been in use? Do we know? No, I, I don't have that information as far as when information was put into it or how long, how old it is. No. 
Any follow-up, Ms. Ramuno? May I have one brief moment, Your Honor? You may. I have no follow-up. Thank you. Any follow-up, Mr. Victor? No, Judge. Okay. Any other questions for Detective Bailey before you let him go? Doesn't look like it. May this witness be excused, Ms. Romano? Yes, please, Your Honor. Mr. Victor? Yes, Judge. You may step down. Thank you. And the state may call its next witness. State calls Detective Larson. Okay, let's go ahead and get Detective Larson. And Ms. Romano, you may proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Detective. Would you please state your full name for us? Yes, it's David Larson. And who are you employed by? I'm employed by the City of Tempe Police Department. And how long have you been employed there? I was hired in uh, October of 2001, so I'm just coming up to 11 years. What is your current position? Um, currently, I am assigned to the Criminal Investigations Division as a homicide detective. Right. And have you held any other positions within the department prior to that? Yes, um, I was a patrol officer um, up until 2005, at which time when I came to the Criminal Investigations Bureau, I did a year as a burglary detective and then a year and a half as a robbery ag assault detective. Now I'm going to draw your attention to the date of December 27th, 2009. What was your position at that time? I was a homicide detective. And were you asked to assist in an investigation involving Elizabeth Johnson, Gabriel Johnson, and Logan McQuarrie? Yes, I was. Right. And what were you asked to do on that date? I was contacted um, by the uh, on-duty criminal investigation supervisor that was um, on call that weekend, as was myself, to respond to any calls in the city that needed a detective to respond. Um, I was contacted at 4.30 in the afternoon on the Sunday um, to respond to an incident um, of a missing child. Right, and where did you respond to at that time? I was originally advised to respond to a trailer located at um, 4605 South Priest, number 153. Um, while en route, I was contacted by my sergeant and advised to respond to the main police department um, for a briefing. Right, and did you, in fact, do that and attend the briefing? Yes, I did. Right, and once you attended the briefing and got the information as to the current status of the investigation, what did you do next? Um, after re receiving the initial in information, um, I was asked to conduct an interview um, with the subject identified as Frank McQuarrie, who was present um, at the station at the time. Um, myself and Detective Ryberg proceeded to conduct that interview at that time. All right. And after you obtained information from Mr. McQuarrie, did you do anything else at the station? Um, no. Was Logan McQuarrie present at the station that day as well? Yes, he was. Okay, and did you speak to him as well? While yes, when I walked, actually, when I walked Mr. Frank McQuarrie back into the lobby, uh, Mr. Logan McQuarrie was um, seated there in the lobby. I was asked um, to ask Mr. McQuarrie if he knew of any financial information or credit card information that Elizabeth Johnson may have. Did you see that information from Mr. McQuarrie? Yes. Now, later that day, were you also requested to speak with a person by the name of Malcolm Phipps? Yes, around 9 o'clock that evening, um, myself and Detective Ryberg were requested to respond to 4605 South Priest Trailer 153 um, to do um, a search um, of the trailer to confirm um, that Gabriel Johnson was, um, in fact, not at that location. Okay, and I'm sorry if you've said it already, but who did you I made you contact there with? with um, I went with Detective Ryberg, and upon our arrival, we made contact with Malcolm Phipps. All right, and did you speak with him and obtain consent to search that area? Yes, I did. All right, and once you obtained the consent to search that area, can you describe for the jury what you did to search the area? The reason for the search was to verify that, um, one, um, Gabriel Johnson was not there, and um, two, if he was there, if he was um, disposed or of harm at that location. So the main purpose of it was to search cabinets, crawl spaces. Um, there was a uh, um, a storage shed that was attached to it that we went through. Um, I went underneath the trailer to check the crawl space beneath the trailer um, to make sure there's no disturbances in the dirt, um, check flower beds and trash receptacles in the area. Okay, and were you able to identify anything of evidentiary value during that time? No, ma'am. Right. Now, that same evening, a little bit later on, were you asked to go to another location and conduct uh, a search? Yes, I was. Okay, and where did you go at that time? Um, that would be the Glass and Garden, um, I believe, Community Church at, I'm going to verify, 8620 East McDonald um, in Scottsdale. Okay, and what information did you have regarding that location? 
Um, I was advised that that was the last known location uh, that um, Gabriel Johnson had been seen, as well as Miss Johnson had been seen at. Um, and I was requested to go there and conduct a search of any communal dumpsters located at that church just to verify that there was um, no evidence that uh, Gabriel Johnson was there. Okay. And why searches of the dumpsters? Um, it had been provided information that um, um, I had been provided information in the briefing that um, he had been disposed of in a trash receptacle. And were you able to find anything of evidentiary value at that location? No, I was not. Now, after you searched that location, what did you do? Um, after I returned from that, I did stand by um, with Detective Ramirez at that point um, while she conducted um, an interview with a male subject, um, after which um, I concluded my involvement at about 1.15 in the morning, which would now be, uh, I think, Monday morning the 28th. All right. And is that male subject a person by the name of Soren Stanescu? Yes. And I'm sorry, you said that that was all you did that day, correct? Yes, ending at about 1 in the morning on Monday. All right. Now, the next time you had involvement with this case, was that on December 29th of 2009? Yeah, that would be Tuesday the 29th. And what did you do that day? I was advised um, that morning um, that uh, a posting or mood change, in quote, had um, been observed on Ms. Johnson's MySpace um, profile page. Um, I was advised of this by Detective Ramirez. Um, after receiving that information, I looked up um, the MySpace page, which was a, a private user account, but the profile page is visible. Um, on the profile page, I observed that there was a, a quote and a mood change um, that was designated there. Um, from that information, then I was instructed to see if I can um, locate or obtain an internet protocol address and location um, that would have been registered when that change was made. Okay. I'm going to back up a little bit, and we're going to go step by step through okay. this. Uh, you mentioned that you received information that there was a posting or status change, a mood change. A mood change and a quote. And a quote by Elizabeth Johnson. Okay. I, I don't know if everyone is familiar with MySpace, so can we explain a little bit about MySpace users can create a profile of themselves, correct? Yes. All right. And on that, they can post pictures. Yes. Correct. Um, as well as statements or quotes? Yes. Okay. And can they also post what you call a mood change? Um, on the profile page itself, which, um, as I say, the, the profile was a private page where you would not have access to the interior content, such as um, messages and photographs, but on the, the profile page that you would see, it had a picture of Miss Johnson um, advising then the, the user ID number, and there was a little box that says mood, and then a word can go in there, and then a quote and a sentence could go in there. Okay. And you mentioned that it's a private page. Um, MySpace users can either select to have everybody be able to view everything on their page, or they can mark it as private where people can only see certain things. Is that correct? I believe so. Okay. Um, and so you were able to access from the information you had a, an account u utilizing the name of Elizabeth Johnson? Yes. And did it also have a picture of her on it? Yes. Okay. May I approach the witness here, Honor? You may. This is marked as Exhibit 122, and I'm just going to show you the third page in. Is that the profile that you observed that day? Yes, I believe it would be this top portion okay. um, right here. So uh, the third page in of this exhibit, just the top portion, is what you were able to view on your computer. That I recall, yes. Right, and it includes a picture of her, her name, as well as a quote and a mood. Correct. All right. Now, what was the quote that had been posted? Um, it was, kiss my ass suckas, spelled S-U-C-K-A-S, with two explanation points behind it. And what was the mood she had posted? Adventurous. All right, and once you observed that information, that you observed that directly on December 29, 2009, correct? Yes. What did you do when you observed that information? I made contact with MySpace, um, their legal compliance, in order to see um, if they were able to obtain the IP address that would um, give us a location of where that login occurred when that change was made. Okay, and what is an IP address? 
It's an internet protocol address, which is a unique set of numbers um, that is given to a specific device, which can be anything from a computer, a phone, anything that can access the internet, that then shows that that device is accessing the internet. Okay. And what did you do to obtain that information at that point? Um, I compl completed an emergency disclosure request um, for MySpace under um, the profile um, user ID number of 915-24048 um, for Elizabeth Johnson. All right. And did you obtain information back from MySpace yes. based on that request? On the 29th, which is still Tuesday, um, at 3 in the afternoon, um, I received um, the last IP address recording under that account name. Um, the IP address came back to 169.139.19.136, and subsequent records checks on that internet protocol address um, advised it was owned or came back to the Broward County School um, District in Miami, Florida, and the Bow Broward County um, Public Library. And once you obtained that information, um, did you forward that information on to others who were investigating this matter? Yes, I did. I forwarded it through my chain of command, and I also then um, completed a second um, emergency disclosure request for MySpace, now requesting all contents um, of the private MySpace page. All right, and did you receive that information from MySpace? Yes, on the 30th, which would now be Wednesday morning, I made contact with their um, legal compliance with MySpace, one, to see if any new IP or login addresses from that account had been registered since the previous afternoon, um, and I advised that there was three new IP address um, logins from that user account. And what were those IP addresses? Um, they came back, one would have, was, would have been on, let's see, the first one was on the 29th, Tuesday at 4.32 and 24 um, seconds Pacific Standard Time, and that was 69841121159. And there was another um, internet login um, that was done on the same date on the 29th, now at 5.36 and 4 seconds Pacific Standard Time. That number was 69 Eight four one zero eight three one, and then on the thirtieth Wednesday morning, um, there was another login at zero six forty one and fifty nine seconds in the morning, and that internet protocol was the same as the previous one, which was sixty nine eighty four one zero eight three one. So it's clear from the record, um, the detective's testifying by looking at his. Um, at his report to refresh, refresh his recollection. Is that correct, Detective? Yes, sir. I just want to make that clear. Now, based on those um, IP addresses that you received, did you do further investigation into where they were registered to or associated with? Yes, a, a check on those, um, those three IP address um, advised they came back to Atlantic Broadband Corporation were owned by them. I then made contact with Atlantic Broadband Corporation's legal compliance um, in order to obtain the location of those IP addresses. And were you able to obtain that information? Yes, I was provided with um, an emergency disclosure request from Atlantic Broadband um, in order to obtain that information, which I completed and sent to them, um, at which time they sent me the uh, locations of the two specific IP addresses for the three logins that had occurred. And what were those locations? I'm going to refer really quickly just to get the address. And just let With, us know when your memory is refreshed. Not a problem. Um, the the one, um, there was, as I said, there was two different IP addresses. One of them came back to the 2030 20th Street, Santa Barbara Hostel in um, Miami, Florida. And the one that were two logins came back to the same address, but a specific apartment number. And to refresh my memory, it was apartment 221 at the Santa Barbara Hostel. And did you relay that information uh, through your chain of command at that time as well? Yes, I did. Now, in regards to the content of the MySpace records that you received, did you actually review those yourself, or did you pass them along to be reviewed by others in the investigation? Uh, they were turned over to Detective Thompson for review. Prior to doing that, however, did were you able to identify what users 
the Elizabeth Johnson MySpace account had been contacting? Yes. Okay. And were there four users total? Yes. All right. And who were those four users during that time period? Um, it would be uh, Tammy Smith, uh, Logan McQuarrie, um, I'll look to refresh my memory, Cassie Newman, and Vanessa Lopes. All right. And in particular, uh, you, I believe you already indicated this, but just so the record's clear, what was Elizabeth Johnson's MySpace user number? Uh, to refresh my member, memory to get that specific number, it was 915-24048. And what was Tammy Smith's user number? I'm also refreshing my memory. It is 138-896839. And what was Logan McCreary's user number? 292-43828. Uh, Lopes, L-O-P-E-S. Now, did you also draft an, or an emergency order at that time to obtain all information regarding Tammy Smith's account? I was instructed to do so, at which time I did. And did you receive that information? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Cross examination, Mr. Victor. No questions, Judge. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Before we let Detective Larson step down, does the jury have any questions for him? Doesn't look like it. May this witness be excused, Mr. Romano? Yes, please, Your Honor. Mr. Victor? Yes, Judge. You may step down. Thank you. And the state may call its next witness. The state calls Detective Welling. Mr. Romano, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Detective, would you please state your full name for us? James Welling. And who are you employed by? The city of Tempe. What is your position there? I am a computer forensics detective. And how long have you been in that position? Approximately three years. What training did you have prior to obtaining that position? As far as the police department, I um, went through the Arizona Law Enforcement Academy, uh, then uh, went through field training and then became a patrol officer. And then uh, after five years, I applied for the computer forensics position which required a basically a year-long certification process through the International Association of Computer Investigation Specialists. Okay. And have you continued to um, educate yourself during the time that you have been uh, a computer forensics detective? I have. It's a continual process of keeping up with technology. All right. Have you conducted uh, numerous investigations involving forensic examinations of devices? I have computers and cell phones. In particular, in this case, were you asked in about, on about January 6th of 2010 to assist in a forensic examination of particular items? I was. All right. And what were you asked to assist in? I was asked to examine a uh, cell phone, which had uh, been brought back to the police station. Okay. And was that a Motorola Evoque Q84 cell phone? Yes, it was. Okay. And was that... Um, given to you from the Miami Police Department or Miami Beach Police Department? I didn't receive it directly from them. One of the other detectives had it, but I, it was my understanding that the phone had been brought back from Miami. Okay. And was this purported to be a phone of Elizabeth Johnson? Yes, it was. That was found in Miami with her? That is correct. Now, at that time, what did you do to conduct an examination of that phone? I first, uh, to process it, a cell phone as evidence. There's a certain procedure that we go through to document the phone. We take pictures of the phone, uh, document the unique serial numbers on the back of the device, and then um, do some preliminary research on what is the best forensic method for extracting information from the internal memory of the cell phone. In this case, uh, I determined that the Celebrate UFED, which stands for Universal Forensic Extraction Device, it's a small electronic appliance that you connect the cell phone to, and then uh, you manipulate the keypads, and it extracts call history, text messages, and things like that from the cell phone, and then writes them to a forensic USB thumb drive. In this case, the only thing that I was able to obtain from the internal memory of the phone was the contact list. Okay. Um, and that was using the Cellubrite? 
Celebrate, that is correct. Okay. C E L L E B R I T E. And did that create a report of the contact list that you found in that phone? Yes, it did. Now, did you do any other examination of the phone at that time? Yes, I did. When we determined, or when I determined that there was additional information on the cell phone that the Celebrate was not able to uh, extract the information automatically, uh, myself and Detective Thompson conducted a, a manual examination of the phone where I would manipulate the phone, the menu keys and whatnot, to go through the call history and the text messaging. And as I moved through each screen, Detective Thompson would take a picture with a camera of the screen on the phone. All right, were you also asked to examine another cell phone purported to belong to Elizabeth Johnson, which was a Nokia 1661 phone? Yes, I was. Okay, and what did you do with that telephone? That cell phone had uh, previously been examined by the Miami Police Department. Uh, that came with that report attached from the department. I conducted my own exam and obtained the same results with the using the same device, the UFED, the Universal Forensic Extraction Device. Basically, just confirming what Miami had already found on the phone. And essentially, was that um, some incoming and outgoing calls on that phone? Yes. C-E-L-L-E-B-R-I-T-E. -E yes. Celebrate. Do you have a witness, Your Honor? You may. I'll show you what's marked as Exhibit 121. Do you recognize this? I do. And what does that document contain? This top document is the, the first three pages is the report from the Celebrate report. The Celebrate device, when it extracts the data, puts it into a user-friendly report. And, and that's the first three pages? That's correct. And that's in regard to the Nokia phone? Yes. All right. And the fourth page of that document, what does that contain? That's the same phone. Inside that phone, there's something called a SIM card, which basically is, is the is a device that allows the phone to operate on the network. And on that device, or on that card, I mean, information can be stored as well there, and such as contact lists or the most recent call history. And that's what this second page, or actually fourth page of this whole document. Okay. And, and then the last pages of the document, I believe there's four. These last four pages are for the, the evoke. Uh, cell phone, which just includes the contact list that I mentioned before. This is the only item I was able to use to celebrate to extract from that other phone. Okay. The state moves to enter into evidence Exhibit 121 at this time. Any objection? No objection. Exhibit 121 is admitted. Permission to publish? You may. Detective, I believe you already indicated, um, but just so we're clear, the first three pages, it indicates page one of three at the top. This is the report properties of the Nokia GSM phone, correct? That is correct. Okay. And when you're referring, when you referred earlier in your testimony to incoming calls and outgoing calls, it's actually labeled on the report, correct? Yes. Okay. And on the second page, it'll list incoming calls, the date and time, and the duration of the call, correct? Yes. Okay. And then there's also a listing of outgoing calls, which indicates the same information. That is correct. Okay. It also documents missed calls that are on the phone at that time, correct? Yes. Now the fourth page, um, can you explain this page again? This is the report for just the SIM card alone that was inside the phone. Uh, so this is the data that was residing on the SIM card and not on the phone's internal memory. Okay. And it some, indicates that there were some numbers that were dialed. Yes. 
And then the last four pages of the report refer to the Motorola QA4 Evoke phone. That is correct. And all you were able to extract at that time uh, were the phone contact list. Was the phone contact list, correct? Yes. And literally that is all the num phone numbers that were stored in the memory of that phone? Yes. to conducting the forensic examinations on these items, did you assist in other tasks in this investigation? I did. Did you follow up on tips that were being called in to yeah. the police station? Yes, I did. And did you brief uh, the other investigators in this matter on the results of those tips? I did. On January 14th, 2010, did you also assist in a search warrant of Tammy Smith's home? Yes. Okay. Or you assisted in the execution of a search warrant? Yes, that's correct. And what was your role during that search warrant? My role during that search warrant was as a computer forensic specialist to determine uh, any devices that were inside the residence or at the residence that were uh, admissible by the, by the search warrant to see if uh, we could identify those items and system. And did you in fact um, take some forensic evidence from Tammy Smith's cell phone? With an image of her cell phone? Yes, her, her Blackberry cell phone. I have no further questions. Thank you. Any cross-examination, Mr. Victor? No questions, Judge. Okay. Um, does the jury have any questions for Detective Welling before we let him go? Doesn't look like it. May this witness be excused, Ms. Romuno? Yes, thank you. Mr. Victor? Yes, Judge. You may step down. Thank you. Ms. Andrews, you may proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon. Would you please introduce yourself to the jury? Gregory Duarte. And what do you do for a living? I'm a police officer with the City of Tempe. How long have you worked as a police officer with the City of Tempe? Approximately eight, eight and a half years. And currently, what's your assignment? I work patrol. And what hours do you work for patrol? Currently I work uh, Tuesday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And have you always worked as a patrol officer for Tempe? Yes. And back in December, uh, on December 27, 2009, were you also working as a patrol officer? Yes. And what hours did you work at that particular time? I believe I was working 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. On that date, did you become involved in an investigation regarding a miss missing child by the name of Gabriel Johnson? Yes. And how was it that you became involved in that investigation? I was dispatched to the Smith residence in North Scottsdale to check to see if uh, Gabriel Johnson was there, and if he wasn't there, to see if they might know where he was. And prior to being dispatched to that residence, were you briefed by anyone about the circumstances surrounding the missing child? No, I had a little bit of um, knowledge because uh, Detective Aguilera, I had overheard him speaking about it a couple of days before out of training. So I called him and as I was on my way and um, got, a little bit, uh, got a little bit of background. And at some point in time, um, in talking to Detective Aguilera, did you agree with him to meet to go over to the Smith residence? Yes. And why is it that Detective Aguilera was going to accompany you at that time? Because, as I just stated, he had a little bit of previous experience um, from a week or so before that he had had some dealings with the Smiths. And other than Detective Aguilera, did anybody else accompany you to the Smiths residence? Tempe Police Officer Richard Laux. And so you arrived at the Smith, Smith residence. Do you recall about what time of day that was? When we arrived, I believe it was 1751 hours, okay, so which is 5.51 uh, p.m. And when you got there, did you have any contact with anybody at the home? Uh, Tammy Smith and Jack Smith. And was there anybody else at the home when you were there? I think one of their children was there, a little a female child. And did you see that child? Yes. While you were there, did you have conversation with Tammy and Jack Smith? Yes. And during that conversation, did they provide you with some information about Gabriel Johnson and Gabriel Johnson being in their custody for a period of time. Yes. 
During that conversation, did you learn the last time that they had seen Gabriel Johnson? Yes. And was that uh, December 18th, 2009? Yes. And did you also learn the location where they had last seen Gabriel Johnson and Elizabeth Johnson? Yes. And was that a church located at 101, the 101 freeway in McDonald Road in Scottsdale? Yes. And did you provide that information to some other police officers? Yeah, I put it in my police report. While you were at the Smith's home, um, did you search the home at all to see if Gabriel Johnson was there that day? Yes, the Smiths allowed us to look around and we, we looked around the house with uh, Jack Smith accompany, accompanying us. And did you find Gabriel Johnson there at the home that day? No. While you were talking to the Smiths, did they provide to you communications that they had had with Elizabeth Johnson between December 18, 2009 and December 27, 2009? Yes. And in doing so, did they do that by sending emails to Detective Aguilera, which he then forwarded to you? Yes. Did Tammy Smith also provide to you and Officer Laux to look at her telephone and take photographs of her telephone? Yes. And during the time that you were there contacting the Smiths, did they also provide you some information off their computer in regard to Elizabeth Johnson and their communication with her? Yes. Did they also provide you with some photographs that they had taken of Gabriel Johnson? Yes. Your Honor, permission to approach? You may. Take a look. Do you recognize the markings on that envelope? Yes. What exhibit is it? 23. 23. I'm sorry. I'm showing you what's been marked as exhibit number 23. Thank you. And is that an item that you impounded into evidence? Yes. And did you do that after obtaining it from the Smiths on December 27, 2009? Yes. And what's contained in that envelope? These are the photographs that were emailed to me that I printed up. Okay. And you say they were emailed to you. Were they emailed to you by the Smiths? Yes. And when did they email them to you? Uh, while we were there at the house, she sent them. And did you obtain them on your computer at work or on uh, No, I received them on my uh, city email, and I printed them up at uh, work. And, um, Your Honor, this time I move to admit exhibit number 23. Any objection? No objection. Exhibit 23 is admitted. Information You may. I'm showing you a photograph right now out of exhibit number 23. There's a number there listed at the top page. What is that number? That's the uh, report number that was generated for this incident. Okay. And the photograph that I'm showing you right now, uh, was that identified to you as who's in that photograph? It's uh, Gabriel's, Gabriel Johnson. Okay. And there's another photograph here on that same page. Do you recognize the little girl in that photograph? Yes, that's the little girl that was at the house. At the Smith home? Yes. And then the, with her... Who was that? I, he was identified to me as Gabriel Johnson. Okay. And then I'm showing you another photograph within exhibit number 23. Again, do you recognize the little girl? Yes. And how do you recognize that little girl? That was the little girl that was there at the house. And the, the little boy in the picture was identified to you as Gabriel Johnson? Yes. I'm showing you another page that has two pictures on it. Do you recognize the woman in that photograph? Yes. And who do you recognize that woman as? Tammy Smith. And the child in that photograph? Is Gabriel Johnson. And then I'm showing you a second photograph on that same page. Again, is that the same little girl you already identified as the Smith's little girl? Yes. And Gabriel Johnson? Yes. And who's the other person in the photograph? I don't know. Santa that, Claus. Does that look like Santa Claus?
speaking with Tammy Smith. Did she provide you with a document? Yes. And did she identify that document as a guardianship document? Yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked as exhibit number 25. Do you recognize that exhibit? Yes. Is that an item you impounded into evidence? Yes. And is that the temporary guardianship document that Tammy Smith gave you on December 27, 2009? Yes. Can I look in here? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I move to admit exhibit number 25. Any objection? No objection. Exhibit 25 is admitted. Can I have permission to publish? You may. Did they point out any Christmas presents to you? Yes. And when they pointed out any Christmas presents, did they identify who they belonged to? Yes. And who did they identify the Christmas presents belonging to? Jack Smith say, said they belonged to Gabriel Johnson. I have no further questions. Thank you. Cross-examination. Thank you, Judge. Officer Duarte, uh, you spoke with uh, Tammy and Jack Smith back on the 27th of uh, December 2009. Is that right? Yes. And uh, you testified that uh, they told you, I don't know if it was both of them or one of them, told you that the last time that they saw Elizabeth Johnson and or Gabriel Johnson was on December 18th, 2009. Is that right? Yes. Did they both tell you that? I don't recall if both of them said that. At least one of them told At you that? At least one of them told me that, yes. Would the other one have agreed with that? Yes. Okay. They, were, they were both present during my conversation with them. Okay, and if one didn't say it, uh, probably they were nodding their head or showing some kind of agreement with that statement? Correct. No further questions, Judge. Thank you. Thank you. Redirect? None here. Thank you. Does the jury have any questions for Officer Duarte before we let him go? Doesn't look like it. May this witness be excused, Ms. Andrews? Yes, sir. Mr. Victor? Uh, no, no objection, Judge. You may step down. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Andrews, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Detective. Would you please go ahead and introduce yourself? My name is Detective Naomi Galbraith, and I work for the Tempe Police Department as a detective. And, Detective, how long have you worked for the Tempe Police Department? Since 2001. And what different assignments have you had in regard to working with the Tempe Police Department? I began as a patrol officer, and uh, in 2006 I moved over as a detective for property crimes. After that I worked financial crimes. Um, which is what I still work in today. Is there any particular training that you received in regard to working in financial crimes? There is. Um, I've gone to numerous trainings that involve looking at fraudulent documents, um, how to investigate embezzlements, and identity theft in different forms of money laundering cases. And Detective, I'm going to ask you to speak up a little bit. I know the microphone in front of you is kind of echoey, but it's a little hard to hear you way back here. Okay. Um, and I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you. You said you learned to investigate some type of documents and some type of financials. Correct. I, um, my investigations involved financial crimes, including money laundering, forgeries, embezzlements, thefts, identity theft. On... Approximately January 4, 2010, were you asked to become involved in an investigation regarding a missing child by the name of Gabriel Johnson? I was. And on that date, what, it, what was it that you were asked to do in regard to that investigation? I was asked to provide assistance with um, doing financial background checks for both Tammy Smith and Elizabeth Johnson. And did that also include financial background checks for Jack Smith as well? Yes. And. During that investigation, what was the purpose of looking into the financial backgrounds of those persons? The main purpose was to, to try and find um, Gabriel, um, and we often use financial documents um, to show where money is spent, perhaps where assets are located, 
perhaps different properties, so we would have different avenues to look for him, different locations. In regard to Tammy and Jack Smith, how is it that you investigated their finances? Where did you start? I began with a credit check so that I could find out uh, with whom they had financial accounts. I also used their residence and then I obtained subpoenas for those locations and those financial institutions um, that I received and ordered documents on those. So in order to get the financial documents regarding an individual such as Tammy and Jack Smith, you have to have a court-ordered subpoena to get those? That is correct. And did you, at some point in time, obtain through subpoenas financial information regarding Jack and Tammy Smith? I did. And, and when you received that financial information, did you obtain any information that helped you lead to the whereabouts of Gabriel Johnson? I did not. Now, in regard to Elizabeth Johnson's financial information, did you also have to seek subpoenas to look into that information? I did. Before you were able to issue subpoenas, did you have to find out what type of financial institutions that she actually used? I did. How did you go about doing that? Um, the first way I, I did by running her credit check to see what financial institutions would show up. And what else did you do to find out about the financial institutions? Um, I was also able to, um, we had information of a credit card that had been used. And uh, I used that credit card and s submitted a subpoena to J.P. Morgan Chase Bank to get the information. And was that a credit card used in San Antonio, Texas? That is correct. At a hotel? Yes, ma'am. And when you submitted the subpoenas and got the information you were requesting regarding the financial information, um, well, let's talk about the J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. Um, did you say that was a debit card? Yes, a Visa debit card. Okay. In regard to that, when did you obtain the information back? When did you get it? When did I receive the subpoena? Yes. The information returned to me? Yeah. I I do not recall the exact date. Um, is January 11, 2010 sound? That correct? sounds accurate. When you obtained the information, what did you first notice regarding that J.P. Morgan Chase Bank debit card? I noticed that as a uh, sorry, December 12th of 2009, that there was a balance of $485.18. And after that time on December 12th, 2009, did you notice any other activity prior to December 18th, 2009? There was no other activity until January, sorry, until December 18th, 2009. Okay. And on December 18th, 2009, did you note some activity on that card? I did. And what activity did you note at that time? At 10.05 in the morning, um, that debit card was used at an ATM to withdraw $480 in cash at a J.P. Morgan Chase Bank located at 2568 West Southern in Tempe. And was that from the ATM there at that bank? Correct. And, and then, so was there a balance left over of $5.18 at that point? That is correct. And did you obtain further information regarding other activity on that account on December 18, 2009? I did on December 18th at, at uh, 5.55 p.m. The remaining $5.18 was used as a debit at a Chevron station in Scottsdale at 88.23 sorry, 88 East Chaparral Drive. And so the, did that clear out and empty the account of all the monies? Correct. The account was now at a zero balance. Now you said that that last money was drawn at 8823 East Chaparral in Scottsdale, Arizona? Correct. And what time was that? That was at 1755 hours, which Five, is 5.55 p.m. Now, sometime during your investigation, did you obtain information that Gabriel Johnson had last been seen at 8620 East McDonald Drive at the Glass and Garden Community Church in Scottsdale? Correct. Did you look up um, on MapQuest to see how far away the church was from that bank where that money was withdrawn? I did. It was 1.3 miles. 
Did you also in investigate into Elizabeth Johnson's Department of Economic Security information? I did. What exactly is, what can you obtain from the Department of Economic Security regarding financial information? Uh, the Department of Economic Se Security, we call DES. They, DES has information about reported income for persons in the state of Arizona. It also includes information for any assistance that's provided to persons, financial assistance from the state. And did you use a subpoena to obtain the information from them? I did not. And why is that? For law enforcement um, official business, a subpoena is not required. And did you obtain some information about Elizabeth Johnson's income from those records? I did. Um, I observed that um, May 19th, sorry, May 16th of 2009 was the last date of reported income in the state of Arizona. And was there some kind of assistance that was reported that Elizabeth Johnson was receiving? There was. Between March, I believe March 16th through, uh, sorry, that will be March 19th, 2009 through 11, uh, November 28th, 2009, she received $222 a week, and that was loaded onto that J.P. Morgan Chase Bank debit visa card. And why is it important to determine what types of funds that Elizabeth Johnson had and was obtaining in regard to a missing child? When we have an idea of how much funds a person has available to them, it helps us know the scope of their ability to, of where they are able to go to, travel to, have enough money for. Now, at the time that you were obtaining this information, Elizabeth Johnson was already in custody, is that correct? Correct. And so if you're obtaining this information after the fact, why is it useful to, to find out this information? If we can find locations where expenditures were made, those are p places we can send people to assist us in searches. And at that point, you were still looking for Gabriel Johnson? We were looking for Gabriel Johnson. On January 11, 2010, did you run a vital records check? I did. And who was that on? That was for Craig Cherry. Okay. And what is a vital records check? Vital records check checks um, birth and death records for persons in the state of Arizona, or vital records checks for Arizona does that. Each state has their own. And what were you looking for in regard to Craig Cherry? We were looking to see if he had fathered any children in the state of Arizona. And, and in the state of Texas. And did you find any birth records showing that Craig Cherry had fathered any children in either Arizona or Texas? We did not find any records for Craig Cherry at all. On January 12, 2010, did you assist in the search warrant at Elizabeth Johnson's trailer? I did. And what was your role at that search warrant? I assisted in finding items of evidence that could be useful and potentially giving us a clue of where they might have gone to. And based on your knowledge today, is anything that you found in that search warrant helped you locate any information regarding where Gabriel Johnson is? No. On January 14th, 2010, did you assist in a search warrant at Jack and Tammy Smith's home? I did. And what was your role at that search warrant? Again, I was uh, there to assist in locating items that could help us lead to the location of where baby Gabriel Johnson could be. And again, did you find anything of evidentiary value that assisted in, in that goal? Mm -hmm. That found to find baby Gabriel, no. Um, during your time working on this case, did you also investigate some leads? I did. Can you tell us a little bit about how leads were generated and received and assigned in this particular case? Okay. Um, the, the leads were generated through NICMIC, the National um, Center for Explo Exploited Children and Missing Children. And uh, they set up a hotline for anyone in the country to be able to call in possibilities. They take information and then the leads are generated to the law enforcement agency. And then once they come to our agency, they're divvied out to different detectives for follow-up. And about how many leads did you were you assigned to follow up on? I had 16 leads. And in following up on those leads, did you write reports on those and provide those to other detectives in the case? I did. At 
at some point in time, did you obtain items out of property and submit them to the D Department of Public Safety Crime Lab? I did. What was the purpose of submitting those items to the crime lab? We had items that contained handwriting samples for both Elizabeth Johnson and Tammy Smith, and the purpose was to send them to Detective Cridle with DPS for a handwriting analysis. And is Detective Cridle, is that Alan Cridle of the Department of Public Safety? That is correct. And is he a handwriting an analyst? Yes, he is. And you indicated that you needed to provide some samples of handwriting of Tammy Smith and Elizabeth Johnson. Where did you get those samples of handwriting? Those items I obtained from, they were impounded as evidence, and I obtained them from evidence and drove them to the DPS lab. And did you provide some documentation for Alan Cridle to compare those handwriting samples to, to, to determine if he could see whose handwriting was on that particular document? I did. And what was that document that you provided to Alan Cridle? Um, there were a number, but one of them was, um, one was a journal entry, some were checks, and another was a court document for, uh, for custody. And let me clarify, the journal entry and the checks, were those, were those items that you wanted Alan Cridle to use as known handwriting samples? Correct. And as a known handwriting sample, handwriting sample where you say, this person wrote this, compare it with something else? Correct. And did you then provide to Alan Cridle another document that you wanted him to determine whose handwriting was on that document? I did. And what was that document? That was the um, custody document, the court document um, that I just referred to. And is that the document that contained the name Craig Cherry? It did contain the name Craig Cherry. In regard to paternity of Gabriel Johnson? That is correct. And after you submitted those items to Alan Cridle, did you eventually get a report back from Alan Cridle? I did. He sent me a report of his findings. And did you provide that report then to the detectives in the case? I did. I have no further questions. Thank you. Cross-examination, Mr. Victor. Thank you, Judge. Detective, based on your investigation, would it be an accurate statement to say that on uh, December 18, 2009, uh, Elizabeth Johnson cleaned out her account? That's accurate. It happened in two different transactions, right? That's correct. But that happened on December 18, 2009, both of those transactions? <laughs> correct. Would it also be a fair and accurate statement to say that, based on your investigation, there were no other financial transactions made by Elizabeth Johnson in Arizona after December 18, 2009? None that I became aware of. No further questions, Judge. Thank you. Thank you. Any redirect? No, thank you. Um, before we let Detective Galbraith leave, do we have any questions from the jury for her? Doesn't look like it. May this witness be excused, Ms. Andrews? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Rector? Yes, Judge. Detective, you may step down. Thank you. Let me confirm and make sure. Does that it for the state today in terms of witnesses, I believe? That, that does conclude. Okay. So we're getting out early today, too. Um, we'll come back at 1030 tomorrow uh, for... A morning session only, so you have the afternoon free tomorrow, and then we'll have our weekend recess. So until then, remember the admonition, and we'll see you tomorrow morning at 1030. Okay, please be seated, everyone. We're outside the presence of the jury. Okay, other than scheduling issues, anybody need to talk about anything? Not to stay early. No, Judge. Okay, I think we can do this off the record, at least for the time being. Okay, so... Doesn't look like we have a, an available jury. On October 5th, one juror, juror number eight, is not available. I'm not inclined to start striking jurors because they're not available for days that we told them they didn't need to be available for. Jurors 5 and 15 are not available Monday, Tuesday, and then into the rest of the week. And in addition, I think on the 10th, juror number 6 indicated she was also not available. So the bottom line is I don't think we can get there in terms of having the jury um, either deliberate or otherwise be here on October 5th or the 8th through the 12th. So we need to plan accordingly. Anybody disagree with that? No, Your Honor. I think it's clear that they're unavailable on those days. Okay. All right. Let me think about um, 
what we're going to do and the time frame, I'm going to, I want to actually just chart out where I think we're going to be and then what's the best way of proceeding. What I'd like as best you can, Ms. Andrews, is, is give me an idea of what witnesses are remaining and your best estimate understanding that I'm not going to hold you to it in terms of trying to speed you up or otherwise tell you that you've got to comply with this schedule. Your best estimate as to how long you believe those witnesses will take so I can get an estimate for when the state's going to rest. I'm going to operate under the assumption that the defense is not presenting any evidence, but I want to make it clear that's not necessarily going to be the case. It's possible this, the defense reserves the right to call witnesses, whether they be it be Ms. Johnson or otherwise, but I'm making plans as if the defense doesn't, in case the defense doesn't. If the defense does, it may take us into Wednesday, Thursday, and beyond, but I need to make arrangements in case the defense does not. And just for the record, Judge, I have not said that I'm not going to call any witnesses. And, and that's clear, although we're not on the record, that's but true. for whatever. Just so you know. Right, and it is clear. You haven't told me that you're not going to call witnesses. Okay, so give me an idea. Tomorrow morning we have Detective Matt Harris. He will take no longer than the morning we anticipate. Okay. Um, on Monday is when we have some out-of-state witnesses, which is why we had some scheduling issues. Um, we have Annalisa Urias. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, Luis Chavez. Uh, Special Agent Flores and Special Agent Morales from the FBI. And then Detective Thompson, who we are moving from tomorrow, assuming we can sort out those issues on the disk. Um, and then, Your Honor, I, I don't, I can't say that we'll take the full day with those witnesses, but the following two witnesses were not available until the following day as they're also traveling from out of state. Um, that would be Detective Jenny Velasquez and Special Agent Chavez, and then we have Detective Ramirez left. Okay. Um, Special Agent Chavez and Detective Velasquez, I don't think will take too very long based on my understanding of their knowledge. Detective Ramirez may take a little while, but... Um, so it sounds like we're on course to definitely finish um, on Tuesday if we don't have any surprises going forward. Um, okay. We'll talk tomorrow. What I'd like to talk about tomorrow is a, a definitive game plan after I think about this for a little while, what we would do 